There are a ton of fans out there. Some are small, some are big and some are really small. But there are also really big ones. Meet Silverstone's Sharkforce 160 ARGB, a very interesting fan. From top to bottom, left to right, this thing measures 160mm. However, it uses the same mounting spacing as a regular 140mm fan. How do they do it? Well, they just tried their best to reduce the amount of space between the screw holes and the blades as far as possible without losing stability. And it really worked! Compared to a Noxia NFA14, there is quite a bit more wing space that they squished out of that 160mm form factor. However, just because it uses 140mm mountings does not mean that everyone can install them. Take for example our fan benchmark case, the Fantex P500A. In the front it was not an issue, thanks to the fact that behind the front panel there is pretty much just empty space left and right. We could install it and because the average 140mm hole, like the one for the fan blades, is also a bit bigger, the metal around the fan won't block the fan in any significant way. For the back spot, however, this didn't work out so well because the back fan is pretty much sealed off with the mainboard on one side and the metal bracket on the other one, so we were not able to mount it in there. So we just mounted it behind it for the benchmarks, but we will get to that later. There are actually cases built specifically with these types of fans in mind. Silverstone's SETA H1 for example, or a ton of those Cooler Master cases with those giant holes in the front. Or even be quiet. The Pure Base 500 is a perfect example. Two of those will fit in the front and two in the top, and you got yourself a PC that slowly moves throughout the room. Anyway, let's take a closer look at those fans. Inside a Shockforce 160 AHB box, we will get some of that cabling necessary to make this thing spin. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you our opinion is on this topic, there are no cables coming out of a shark force by default. But there are two ports, one marked with fan and one marked with LED. With each fan you will get two cables and a pack of screws. Now those cables are kind of special. They are actually splitters and adapters all in one. If you were to install two fans right next to each other, you could use the fan and LED cable on one of the fans and then ignore the second pair of cables and connect the second fan using the leftover connector on the first cable of the first fan. Alternatively, if you would use three fans right next to each other, you could also remove the adapter port of the second fan and hook that up to the splitter of the first fan, giving you one additional splitter spot left for the third fan or to continue the chain until the earth spins faster. In the end, the thing you are left with is a regular 4-pin PVM and a 3-pin ARGB for software RGB control. Now I'm not saying this is a bad approach. It does come with the handy feature of having less cabling around the fan and then only a single one or two with RGB going away from the fan. So it's kind of a big plus. My only concern is about the connector that they used. I know that connector from other fans it's not a very sturdy one. I killed a lot of those. And looking at the position where it is on the fan frame, you are not able to properly disconnect it without pulling on the wires. So yeah, three, four, five, six times, maybe 10, who knows, but at some point that thing will die. The fan itself is looking interesting as well. The fan blades are using that shock force design that Silverstone already slapped on top of some other fans. And the idea here being that the pattern on the fan wing is supposed to alter the airflow while positively improving performance and reducing the noise. How this will perform we will say later on, but we all know that it's minimal at best. Other than that, the fan is actually quite simple. There are a bunch of LEDs in the central area that illuminate across the milky acrylic wings until the frame's border. Now, two things on that approach. A, the LEDs they use are really freaking bright. B, they are not bright enough. Don't get me wrong, they did the best they could, but the light never reaches the outer border. Not that they didn't try, but the fan is 160mm big, and that's a hell of a hurdle to overcome. So yeah, our RGB implementation is like a bit meh, although the choice of material seems to be perfectly fine. They did a good job on that, but it's a giant. Other than that, I wanted to give some plus points for the outer frame strength. I've seen 140mm fans flex like hell just by looking at them, but this is a 160 
and it doesn't flex. Even if I apply real strength, no, it, it doesn't flex. Very, very good job. By spec sheet, this 160mm giant is supposed to be pushing up to 1600 RPM while it's pushing 160 CFM at 2.21 mm of H2O. Let that sink in. 160 CFM, an NF-A12X25 is pushing 60. That's three times as much, plus an extra 20. <laughs> yeah. For our benchmarks, I really wanted to use them inside a standardized testing machine. For the front, it wasn't really an issue. Two went in perfectly fine. Maybe just using a single screw, but they were on. The back one, however, yeah, that one had a problem, so I installed it outside. Now this does come with a huge disadvantage for the shock force. After all, there are now 25 millimeters plus the thickness of the metal, more space in between the back fan and the CPU heatsink. So by every stretch of the imagination, the fan now has a disadvantage, but the fan didn't care. <laughs> Letting it spin straight at its max 600 RPM allowed the CPU to drop down to 38.6 degrees C above ambient. That's place number freaking 4 on our benchmark charts. That's amazing. However, 160 millimeters times 600 rotations per minute are equal to a lot of noise. On the noise to performance side, we saw that the upper third of the shock force performance spectrum was indeed a bit of a, of a brute force thing. However, once you turn the fan speed down, things drastically change. After a few percent, the shock force started to overrun things like the Bionics P120s, regular P12s, and even the Lightwings 140 high speed. Looking at the whole graph, the shock forces perform somewhat equal to an Arctic F14 and Bionics F140. A, a lot more headroom. Not bad. So where does this leave us? Well. This is one hell of a solution, not at max speed, but once you turn them down, even at like 25% of their max speed, those are pushing a surprising amount of air. Build quality wise, a really really good surprise, considering that bigger often means less durable or more flexy, it was surprising to see how well those are made. The only negative aspect for me is the connector. I get the idea and I like it. I just know from experience that those types of connectors have quite limited lifespan if an idiot like me uses them. Another kinda negative aspect, but not really, is the ARGB implementation. I think they did their best, but as long as you don't plaster the outer frame full of LEDs too, I just don't see how the light should be able to get everywhere. So for who are those fans? Well. Anybody who has a case that can fit them. Take a CETA H1 case, for example. That thing can house two of them. Why not use the available space? Why go for little 120mm fans and let them spin at full speed during a load if a 160mm fan can push the same amount in and out at half the rotation speed and most of the time also then half the noise? The noise to performance ratio is not as good as an NF-A12X25, though don't forget our shock force was measured while being handicapped. But if you pair it with a halfway decent air cooler, you will never hear them. They can spin at 10% all the time, you just won't care. But you will still have a huge amount of headroom. The problem is just, not every case supports these. Sure, they use 140mm holes, but don't blindly trust this. If you ask me, get a piece of carton and then cut like a 160x160 160 piece. And use carton that is a bit thicker, it, shouldn't be, it should be stiff and not fold like a piece of paper. And then just try. Does it fit in? Great. Not? Then don't. And considering that you would need to make measurements while not really being able to get the ruler in properly, the piece of carton approach is kinda better. But okay, this should be it for Silverstone and their Shockforce 160 ARGB. At this point a huge thank you to Silverforce for sending them over, but if you wanna keep watching, have a look on our take on the Squamma 2505Y. Insane static pressure. On a side note, we now have channel membership, so if you are looking for a good way to sell your soul for an RG poop emoji, that's a pretty good way to go. Additionally, you can rest assured that the income will not only keep the channel afloat, but it will also serve to have some money for a new frontal squammer. Because making it out of titanium turned out to be a lot more expensive than I initially believed. Anyway, thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.